type in the conversation text. So we can start. My name is Ljub Shefremov and I'll be teaching research at the workplace. Please welcome to the first lecture, which is called Introduction to Research. Today, I will explain shortly the webinar, what it will it be about, and also the three other webinars. And also I will explain your assignments, your task that you need to fulfill in order to successfully complete the course. If you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me to write in the text box on the left side. So, <clears throat> I will just briefly present myself. I work in a GFK, it's market research company. I've been working there in the past 12 years. Apart from this, I teach at the High School of Journalism and Public Relations, and also I teach at University of American College, Skopje. So now we will start <clears throat> with the webinar. I would like to tell you that we have four assignments. The first assignment is desk research on a specific topic that all of you members of the team will decide what will be the topic of the desk research that you're about to conduct. And the today lesson is actually about that, and we're going to speak about the structure of this report, the outcome that I expect is a PowerPoint presentation about the topic that you together will select in the team. The second assignment is actually designing a questionnaire for quantitative research. It should be done in Word document and it should have around 30 questions plus demography, plus demographic questions. We will talk about this as well on a special <coughs> webinar. So, as I said previously, if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt. The deadline is every Monday. And I encourage everyone of you to participate in the team, to be creative, and I hope this will motivate you to do the tasks. The third assignment is actually a design of a guide for qualitative research. Again, the outcome is a Word document of around 20 questions, and we will talk about qualitative research as well. And the last but not least is the fourth, is the fourth assignment. Uh, the deadline for this, I think it's 25th of December. That's why uh, please work in order not to be late for the New Year's Eve. Regarding the last assignment, it's about the, the team will create a case of different cases where there was violation of ethics or where there was no violation of ethics in research. We will also talk about this in more specific. Now I will come back to the topic of today which was introduction in the webinar and desk research. The most easy way to find out what people think on a different topic is to ask them. But maybe as you have seen on TV, there are some people who just go around the street and ask people a few questions and they present it as, as a public opinion. No, this is a different type of research that we will not use. Here, we're going to use how to separate the facts, how to make a systematic and objective research. As you might, some of you might know that this topic is covered as one fifth of everywhere in the world from the postgraduate and graduate studies. Many companies use market research in their everyday business. When they launch some new product, they want to see how the product is performing. They want to see whether the product is appealing to the customers, they like it or not, what do they like, what they dislike. Also about the ads, when they want to test whether a specific ad <coughs> will uh, have a good effect on the target audience. Also many TV and radio stations are conducting research as part of their life. Maybe even some of you have already participated in some type of market research so far, I don't know, for a 
for needs of a graduate paper or I don't know postgraduate paper of your friends, relatives, etc. Uh, most evident example of this is when you <clears throat> listen on TV or when you see on TV, you know, for example, the last the last poll on American presidential elections, for example. Uh, Trump versus Clinton. So, as you can see, something is happening on the other side of the planet, and we hear that the percentage are 45 to 40 in favor of one candidate or another. So, this was a short introduction, and now we will continue with types of research. As you can see here, there are four important elements that you need to consider when doing every research. It's like doing a story from a journalist part perspective. It is not enough to know what do you want to ask and why do you ask. You should know who gives you the answer and also how to ask. As you can see here, I have bolded four key words. What, why, who and how. Research. We do research because we have a need for research. We don't do research because I just got out, up of the bed today and I don't have what else to do and I will do research. No, this is the wrong approach. Or we do research because we have homework. Again, no. We do research with a specific purpose and that purpose which is answered by the question why, and also the question what, what we do for research and why we do it, comes from, from a specific problem. For example, uh, we read some theoretical explanation about some phenomena and want to find out more, want to find out why something is behaving like it is behaving, and therefore want to provide some new theoretical explanation about it or want to provide uh, a solution for that. For example, many people in their private life or in their business life face with different problems. So we do business in order to discover the problem, but also to propose a solution and to see how the solution will, will function. Apart from these two related things, what, what are we doing for research and why are we doing that? There are also additional two elements. Who gives you the answer? Very important. This is related to the target group and how to ask if you're doing quantitative or qualitative research. These are also very important aspects because if they're not aligned, you could get a biased story. So you will not get the valid and reliable results. And that is what counts not only in science, but counts in what you get as a practical solution. In general, there are two types of research, qualitative and quantitative research. Qualitative research answers questions about nature of phenomena. And the goal here is to describe the phenomena of interest that we want to make research on and understand it from participants' point of view. So when I ask you, why are you satisfied with your mobile operator? or with your bank, or with your toothpaste, you will always give me answer on the question why you're satisfied. Some person will be satisfied from one thing, another person from another, and I will be able to understand why you're behaving or you have an opinion that you have at the moment for a particular topic. On the other hand, we have the quantitative research, which is a bit di different and we will mostly focus on quantitative research today and in the next webinar. Quantitative research actually answers questions about data that can be measured. And the goal here is to explain and predict. I will talk a little bit more about on the next slides, but here I just want to mention that everything that is related to counting, that we can count, is related to quantitative research. For example, what is the market share 
of a certain medicine on this market, or what is the market share of a bank, of a mobile operator, or etc. Everything that is related to specific counting, which involves statistics, is related to quantitative research. On the next webinar, we will also have a guest on the quantitative research, which is the person who works as a market research specialist in a company, so we will have a practical experience, we will have a chance to hear how research is conducted from a business point of view. Now we will continue with designs. In general, there are two types of designs, research designs, cross-sectional study and longitudinal study. Cross-sectional study is a one-time research. You do it once for a specific topic, specific purpose, you use it and that's it. You're finished with it, with this study. On the other hand, we have the longitudinal study which stretches over several several years, decades, or sometimes ages. It depends on the time and money that you have. Longitudinal study, again, it's divided in two approaches. We have the trend approach and the panel, and the panel approach. The trend approach consists of examining different people in, at the different points of time. For example, now you're 25 years of age and I would like to ask you about your attitude toward EU enlargement. After five years, different people at the age of 25 years of age, I ask about their attitude towards enlargement of EU. And again, after 10 years, I ask different people, sample C, about the same question of interest, which was EU enlargement topic. So, as you can see, there are three different groups that I ask, but ask them the same question, so I'll see how they behave. On the other hand, we have the panel approach, which actually asks the same sample of people over and over again. When they're 20 years of age, after 5 years, when they're 25 years of age, and, and, 30, and when they're 30 years of age, but again, we ask them the same question, the attitude towards EU enlargement. The good thing here is that we can see over time, we can track who changed or not, who changed their opinion regarding EU enlargement or not. But there also there is a bad side of this approach because we cannot always find or track the people over the years. Some people will go out of the country, we cannot find them, some people would not want to participate again in the same research, etc different approaches, but that's why, as you can see, different approaches exist and you can combine them. I hope it is clear so far. Now we've came to the point of research techniques. Again, for some classification, they are divided in two techniques. One of them is interview, the other one is questionnaire. The interview consists of direct interview, telephone interview, and internet interview. Direct interview is a one-to-one, face-to-face interview when you talk to one another, when you ask the person about his attitudes, beliefs, her attitudes, beliefs, etc. Telephone interview, as the word says, is done over telephone. Usually you call the person but it should be shorter than direct interview face-to-face. -face. On the other hand, we have a similar situation here, internet interview, like Skype interviews, which, depending on the geographical and time constraints, can last different time. On the other hand, we have the questionnaire approach, the questionnaire technique. We have direct questionnaire, mail questionnaire, and internet questionnaire. Direct questionnaire is when you have a printed form, you give it to the respondent participant of research, he fulfills it, 
and returns back to you. Mail questionnaire is when I send you a mail, mail questionnaire to you over regular post. You receive it, fulfill it, and return it to me. And we have the internet questionnaire when there is a pre-programmed version. I send, just send you the link, you answer it, and I have the answers. So these are actually some variations, as you can see. On this slide, I give a brief overview of the research process. An overall research process, how does it look like? And we will talk in more details in the next slide. So, as we said before, we will repeat some familiar stuff. First, there is a problem definition. You have to define what is the area of interest that you want to research. After this phase, when you have defined it, you go to another stage, which is called development of an approach to the problem. When you decide whether you will use mixed mode, you will combine quantitative and qualitative research. By default, you always must use desk research. That's why I'm not mentioning it here. But sometimes a desk research is regarded as, as a separate research and it could provide you an answer to your problem. Next phase is research design formulation, when you decide about the number of focus groups that you will have, or you decide about the number of participants that you will have, different profiles, who will you include, who will be a target group, how will you measure everything, and we will speak also as well about that. The fourth phase is actually the fieldwork phase, where you conduct the research. The next phase is you get all this data, you have it for quantitative research, you have to put them into the computer, organize them, and at the end, you have to make some analysis out of it. If it's a quantitative research, then we have some statistical analysis, some conclusions. On the other hand, if it's a qualitative analysis, you do a discourse analysis or different approach that you might take and at the end you prepare, present a report. And if you work in a company, it is very important that you have the last phase as well, which is called the follow-up phase, when you see that the solution that came out of the research, whether it functions or not, after six months, after 12 months, when you have implemented the results of the research. So, as we already stated, in general, research could be divided in three phases. First phase is preparation of research. Second phase is the actual conduction of field work. And you will see what that means for desk research today. And the third phase is analysis and reporting. Now I will talk about each phase in details. You also have a short video about the first phase, about preparation of research uh, that I prepared for you, which is called, well begun is half done. So as you see, as the proverb says for itself, if you prepare well, you will do the task well. Well, if you don't prepare, you will not do the task or the results that you expect. Practically speaking, if you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail. So, as we said, in the first phase, you have to define the goals of research and the problem of research. What will be your problem? How you will link it to the work that someone else did that before? After you have defined Oh, there is a question, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, I understand your question. So the four assignments are related. 
The first assignment is desk research on a specific topic. So you need to focus, for example, if you decide to do a study on banking industry, you have to make a desk research on the bank industry on a specific bank or product. For example, now it's actual, now it's relevant mobile banking or electronic banking. The second assignment is quantitative research. You have to make a questionnaire for this electronic banking or mobile banking. The third is, for example, how to make a discussion guide. The third assignment, yeah. The third assignment would be guide for qualitative research. And the fourth, you will try to find cases where there were violation of ethics. I consider myself that ethics is very important and that's why I put it here. So, first you have to find out, which is in the desk research phase, you have to make your homework. And your homework is literature review. You have to find out who did what before you on the topic actually that you're investigating, the topic that you're exploring. And this is called desk research, literature review, secondary data, etc. We'll speak about that in more details in the next slides that follow. So, when you finish with defining goals of research and what your problem actually was, and you connect it to the literature review, to the desk research that you have conducted, there are additional four elements that you need to consider. And one of them is you have to define your variables. You will ask what is a variable? And now we will focus on a quantitative research. And variable is everything that can be measured. Uh, for example, how many years you have spent in education? Two, three, five, ten, eleven. How much salary do you take? This is an example. And that's why something that is measurable. Because here in research, we're not doing about some philo uh, philosophical or theoretical questions like whether God exists or not, or what is the older, the chicken or the egg, but we're doing with something measurable that can be changed. So this is the first step that you need to consider. Definition of variables, what you measure, and definition of population. For example, in our case, if you want to explore the voting preferences of voters of this country, we'll need to take into account all those who are 18 plus, and they, this is our population. And out of the population, we have the sampling procedure. The population is also related to definition of variables, because whether can you measure that in the specific population or not, they should be inclined. In line, sorry. Does everyone see the presentation, the slides? Please. Vladimir, do you see it? There are some people who claim that they don't. Okay. I think now we will fix this. Please signal when it is fixed. Okay, but we're not stopping here. Mm -hmm. I hope you're following me. So when we have defined the population, we go to forming of sample. And on the next webinar, we will have a specific time <clears throat> uh, tailored specifically to sampling. And that's why I will not, I will not focus more on that today. Related with the sample and population, of course, we have to prepare instrument. And the instrument is actually the questions. How are we going to measure the thing that we're, going, that we're supposed to measure? So when all these five elements are in line, when you have defined your goals, you have defined your population, you know how to form the sample, you have defined your variables, and you have prepared the instrument, this counts as a good preparation that so we can start with the research. Don't forget, well begun is half done. 
phase two depends who makes the research for you, whether you do it for yourself, whether you hire someone else to do it, you work in a company or in different organizations that you want to find out something about the topic of interest, you could hire a company that could do it for you. And if you do it with interviews on, or if you do it online, it depends. There are different situations. It could, this is a, one possible scenario. You select good interviews to do the field work for you. You have to train them to tell them what to ask. You make a small test, whether they understand it or not. They go on the field. They have access to participants. It depends whether it's a business to business research or a residential research, they go to a business premises or they don't go to, to homes of the respondents or they find them in some trade center, etc. You can you control them. And that's it. So I hope this phase is clear for everyone. Now we will continue with the last phase, which is actually the report writing. When you're done with all this, with preparation, first phase, field work, second phase, we came to the third phase, which is report writing. All the data that you have received by different sources in different databases or everything, you have to put them in, into a single file. If you, and now there are different programs. For example, I mentioned one of them, Statistical Package for Social Sciences, SPSS, STATA, SAS, there are different programs that you can make analysis. I'm now talking about quantitative research. There are also softwares for qualitative research like MaxQDA or different softwares. So you have to code the data because the computer does not understand words. You have to transfer them into numbers if we're talking about quantitative research and you're doing the analysis. After, when you're done with the analysis, you have to present the results and here there is a rule because you will get many, many data. You don't present everything, but you present only those findings that are in line with your hypothesis, which conform or reject your hypothesis. And you give some possible explanation why it is like that, like why it is you received some results and why you didn't receive the opposite. Now I will continue with desk research. We start here and at the end of this presentation, I will briefly explain about the structure that your desk research needs to have. I hope everything is clear so far. Now we will be closing the first part. Do you have any any questions so far, please? As I see, no one's typing, so we can continue. We're at the end of presentation. Clear, thank you. Before 1900, as you might have heard, there existed a linear classification those who studied biology, or those of you who studied biology in the, you all know the division of mammals, etc., that is used in the biological science. This is actually a linear classification. And apart from this, we have the Boolean logic, which is actually binary logic, one and zero, and they affect the way records are stored and retrieved today. After 1900, the paper came out the massive printing, and also there were different storage media, like paper, photographic, magnetics, archives evolved. And then there was a breakthrough in the 1980s, the traditional storage, like paper and other different types of uh, microfilms. I don't know if you, have, if you have seen some movies with James Bond, and you can see that uh, there were some lenses that he was looking about, he was putting them on a projector, etc. In the 1980s, the computers, the faxes emerged and they replaced actually the way uh, information was stored. In the 1990s, the, the internet came 
and this was the revolution. There were different uh, search engines at that time, such as AltaVista, Archi, Yahoo, and Google. Yahoo and Google are also present today, and we all use them. And what is the most important thing is after 2000, on around 2000, many laws were passed on freedom of information that every citizen has a right to access to publicly available information. So information is delivered via many sources. This was just a short history, how it evolved. And we came to the nature of this research. We have two terms that are used interchangeably by researchers. And these are desk research and secondary data search. And what do they include? They include consulting and reading many documents, whether it's a book, online document, etc. And also this includes, if you don't have time, interview with experts on a specific topic. For example, you find an expert of, on macroeconomic policy that you want to interview and you don't have time to consult many documents, you just go and make interview with uh, her or him. Here we have a different division. There are two types of desk researchers. We have the primary data, secondary data, and tertiary data. So tertiary data, we'll start with the last. You can remember as a third hand data, which is include, includes different indices, citations, abstracts, etc., which are very short, that can <clears throat> that can point you, that can give you a direction where to look for a different research, which actually is covered is secondary data, which is actually the desk research itself. You can remember this at second hand. There is information that is previously gathered by someone else for a specific purpose, and you're using it, other than the, your current research project. And the primary data is the research that you undertake for a specific purpose. So secondary data. Please focus on this. There are different benefits why we're using desk research. And I will briefly talk about each aspect today. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me. Previous information that someone else gathered for us is very valuable because it always partially can answer our research question. For example, if you find the research why internet banking is not used in India, it could be a direction why people are not using it in Turkey or United Arab Emirates. I don't know. But the key thing is that it doesn't fully answer our research question. But we want to know why people in Macedonia or Slovenia don't use, don't use it. The second good thing is that it helps refine our objectives. If we have a study that someone else did it before us, we can learn his mistakes and see where did this person uh, if it is written, of course, see where this person where this person made a mistake or not. Again, if we're making some kind of primary research, and then this desk research could help us design it better, to look better. Assist sampling. We don't know what is our target group, and this potential desk research conducted by someone else could help us refine or defined specifically the target group of our interest. It can lead us to a good direction. If we have open-ended questions, and we'll talk about that on the next webinar, open-ended questionnaires are just questions which a specific uh, 
question and they don't offer alternatives. And those alternatives we want to transfer into numbers and which are called codes and some desk research could be useful to supply us with the codes for our questions. Desk research, could, we could also benefit from desk research in a way that it could help us understand the results that we got from our primary research, whether we confirmed or rejected our hypothesis, which is related to the last aspect, it could confirm, reject the results of the primary research. They could be different, we're in the same directions, or in India happened something opposite than what happened in Japan, etc. Apart from the good side of desk research, the benefits, we have also the <coughs> additional benefits, which are, it saves time and money, someone else did it before us, so it will save us time, we will not devote that much time, and it will save us money, we will not do it again, we don't have to pay for different uh, journals, etc., where to find the information. Sometimes it is easy to obtain, if it's in a if it's, if it's online, if it's free, we could just download it in PDF format, or etc. Again, it would be very quick to get it if it's online. And it's useful, is, is very useful for international studies. It serves as a basis for comparison. We could find different desk researchers in different countries, so we can compare how something how some phenomena occurred in Macedonia compared to Bulgaria, Russia, etc. So we could compare the three phenomena of interest. As I said, apart from this, the good sides, the benefits that we have, there, is, there are always limits of desk research that we cannot use it fully. And we will also talk about the limits today. One possible limit of the research is that it could not actually exist. There are persons who made the research on banking industry, but no one conducted research on mobile banking or electronic banking. So it may not actually exist, which is the largest problem for, for us as well, because in that case, it doesn't save time and money. It may exist, but it may not be available someone might lock it somewhere. I mean, lock it not in a physical sense, but in some library that you have to pay a certain amount in order to unlock it. On the other side, it could be, it could not be accurate. For example, we are reading a bias survey. Uh, the person did some mistakes in his research design and we are reading this and based on this, we could also make a mistake. Such research could exist, but it could be outdated. For example, someone did that 20 years ago, and now the results are not valid anymore. As I said in the beginning, it only partially answers our problem. It doesn't precisely address the aims of our research, and as we thought, it only provides a partial picture only provides part of the answer that we are looking. Now we will talk about sources of secondary data. In general, there is a division, we have a internal and external data, as the name suggests. The internal secondary data are generated by the organization in question the bank, some statistical office, etc. But for the specific product, for a specific <clears throat> product, service, etc. On the other hand, we have the external sources, the external secondary data, which are available in the form of directories, databases, industry reports, syndicated services. Sometimes we can get them in some newspapers, some online papers, etc. So this is the key thing to remember that they're internal and external data. And we will see what these two types of data cover in detail. 
Internal secondary data, as we talked, comes from the organization in question. The organization gathers many data about its products. It can, it can provide information about the sales in a specific moment of time. What was our sales in January? What were our sales of a specific product or a specific service in May, March, during summer, winter, etc.? Also, it provides information about the inventory that we have at the moment in stock or that we had it in different time period. It also provides information about distribution costs. What were the same distribution costs of our products last year? What are the distribution costs this year? Whether we managed to <laughs> make a positive difference, whether to manage to lower the expenses. Also, we have information about the advertisement spent, the expenditure spending on advertisements in newspaper, television, internet, etc. Always we have information about the prices and about information about the records about sales of different teams. And we also have complaints and service records. These are all internal data. Apart from the internal data that one company keeps, there are also external data which are available. As we said, with the freedom of information laws that were passed, many data became publicly available. For example, we have different commercial sources that we can buy different data. We have the academic sources, different libraries, also some state university libraries that exist, provide some data where we can find out. Many data now exist on online, on internet. We have some other data and we have the industry sources, like some industry always, there is some <clears throat> commercial organization and they, uh, like a chamber of commerce or other, and they have annual reports about the tobacco industry this year, there are some different professional bodies, like monitoring bodies, watch some company organizations like watchdogs when they track every TV or every radio, what are they doing? And we have the trade press. And apart from this, that we will talk, there are some governmental sources which can came from census, from some state statistical offices or from other ministries or other sources. Here, I wanted to pinpoint some important web, web pages where you can find some information. For example, I have put the web page of the European Society for Opinion and Marketing Research, SMR, SMR.org, when there are some publicly available information. is a Society for Market Research. We have the Eurostat Directorate. It is actually the organization that gathers inf the information from all members of EU and also accession members, which you can find on the next web page. The third is because there are persons from different countries, I have included the State Statistical Office of Macedonia, stat.gov.mk, Statistical Office of the Republic of Slovenia, stat.c, and the Turkish Statistical Institute, turkstat.gov.tr. Apart from this, if someone is doing research in the banking industry, you can provide some, you can find some information online on the national banks of the countries. For example, on the National Bank of the Republic of Macedonia, you can see the webpage nbrm.nk, on the Bank of Slovenia, bsi.si, or on the Central Bank of the Republic of Turkey, tcmb.gov.tr, or European Central Bank, for example, which is not stated here but you can easily Google it and find it. So, you have to make a search plan and there are three approaches which are likely. You visit some general or specialist library where you can find the information of interest or as we said, secondary data desk research includes interviews with human experts and at the end, you can make a computer search. 
like one on the picture on the right side, on my right side. Yeah, the answer is on one of the 2,564 websites. So as it's written here, it's not a joke. You have to search many, 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 many sources in order to find the right information. And sometimes it takes several days to find the right information. Good thing is that you make a plan, identify the sources where you can find the information that you will be looking about. You should locate the sources, go to them physically or online, secure access, get the documents, and you can make some track a record during time to see where you stand. So I think that you should make this plan for the next six days because officially the webinar has started so, so as your assignment started so go back in teams decide until tomorrow on the topic and start doing the research as you know you have the deadline which is every monday to 25th you also must make evaluation on the secondary data to see whether it is good or not. What you need to look about is to look on the source and the context. What was the source, in which context the results were presented. You can look for the original purpose, why the research was undertaken at that moment, what was the population that was used, what procedure was taken, and the reason behind the original publication. I just want to repeat myself again here. For any sector, you can look for the top companies, important press, press titles, some associations or directories. And now on the next slide, I will present this, how to assess actually, how to evaluate whether the secondary data that you, you will find and how to include, this is actually a process you have to evaluate it on several questions. For example, questions regarding purpose. Why was it done? Who paid for it? Maybe it was deliberate. What was the problem that was uh, needed to be solved at the specific moment? The second big question is the population. Who are the players in the sector? Who was interviewed? Whether they were users of the specific organization, company or not? How many? or they were just potential clients? What was the source of name? Where did they find it? Online or face-to-face? -face? Now we go into details regarding the procedure. What data capture method was used? Was there any quality control in order to ensure good quality? Is the method making sense? Whether something was wrong or not, valid or reliable? And at the end, we come to the publication why was it distributed, who was the most likely reader to see it, what was the target group of that population, and what decision could have been made on the basis of this project. So far, we have finished the first webinar, and now I will continue with the specific example of your desk research what needs what needs to be included inside so should the first assignment follow this step yes because you will have many sources to evaluate you will have many documents that you have to decide whether to include them or not in your short presentation so you have to actually measure every document against this criteria you're welcome are there any other questions regarding the general procedure if not we can continue with the structure actually of the desk research how it should look like How many sources? Uh, no one can answer this. So 
different. Uh, it depends on the quality of the paper, of course, and the quality and the authors. So you can also look for the authors. So sometimes one author is needed. Uh, some, not necessarily to be famous person, but you know, to use the logical methods at least. I hope I answered your. Uh, yes, this is also part of the structure that the sources should be included. They should be properly referenced, and I will give you a link how to reference them. Because without sources, I could not be able to assess whether you did something good or not. You're welcome. So, if we finish questions, then we can move to the last slide, which actually presents the structure. I would suggest that you use some of this structure. And I will, the message that I want to send here is, this is a possible structure. However, be creative. Express yourself. You can see some elements that the desk research should include. Introduction, overview of industry, area, organization, and pestle analysis, information about the organization, conclusion, and references. We'll talk about each individual element now. The first part is introduction, which should include what is the background research, of your research, why are you doing this, what are your objectives, what you want to accomplish. The second one is overview you on the of the organization of the industry, of the area that you want to perhaps sometimes it could it will be NGO. It doesn't necessarily mean the organization to be a company or some public body, or it could be a state. You know, sometimes the our area of interest could be a specific state. And you can also make what, uh, what I advise you to do is the pestle analysis. I don't know if maybe someone of you use it or not, but it's a good tool. And what does it include? It includes different uh, forces that shape the society. For example, political, economic, social, technological, environment, and legal. From a political uh, point of view, it could include the current political situation, whether it is positive or not, whether you want to go, whether you want to enter it into you, whether, whether there is a crisis in politics at the moment, or wh what kind of policies the, cover, the current government uh, actually uh, prescribes. On the other hand, the economical uh, situation presents whether this, the situation in the society is good or not, whether we have the economical downturn or upswing, and there, there, there is a different, inf whether there is a good inflation, whether there is inflation at the moment or not, or different economic parameters that I use. Macro and microeconomical sources I use for this. The social Analysis focuses on the social cultural part. For example, in some countries, they don't they don't eat cows, and you know we, we cannot import meat or products from or, or milk products there. You know, if they don't if they find the cow as a different you know symbol. Technological forces are related to different ways that you communicate with your customers. You know, the situation evolves and changes. Most of the time, there are different uh, now social media that you can communicate with your customers. Apart from this, as you can see, there are different uh, waves of distribution of your products or services like uh, Uber or uh, Booking or, I don't know, other services which are rapidly changing the way we <coughs> we consume or use the products. Uh, environmental aspects are aspects that have recently uh, taken swing, and those aspects are related mostly to pollution, whether the product that the company produces pollutes the environment or not, 
and which is good for the sustainability of the society. And at the end, we have the legal aspects, which involves whether uh, the health and safety of employees that produce the product also includes consumer rights, whether you're protected as a customer or not. So this is very shortly about this pestle analysis. And we continue with information about the organization and about the product, about the specific service that you want actually to, <laughs> to examine. Here you can make one paragraph or two very shortly about the history of the organization, what is the mission, what products does it offer or services, or you can focus just on one product which you can target and you can make a deeper analysis what will be the future of this product. But this again is related to, to the objective of your research. And we have the SWOT analysis, which is related to external and ex external, internal and external factors that are crucial for success of a product or service, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and trends. But I think this is, you, you're familiar with this analysis. And in the end, based on all these sources that you have actually consulted, you will make a brief conclusion. What's new? What is the explanation? Why, why did you got the results that you got? Maybe you expect something different and you received uh, different results. So you have to explain this. What are the limits of the current research? Because, for example, now we have only seven days. You can stress this, but apart from this, maybe you didn't find uh, some documents. And what would you suggest for the person who will make the next research related to banking or etc.? And again, what I stated are references. Uh, someone might use different references, but I prefer to use the references uh, proposed by the American Psychological Association, the reference system, which you can find on Google. And I have actually provided the link where you can find the different guidelines for books, for documents, for different online documents. Regarding online documents, I want to stress that it is important uh, to write when did you access the document. For example, access it 28th of April 2016, because tomorrow it might not be available. You know, the situation with the web changes all the time. But if you have any questions, just Google that, and there are also good explanations of how to quote. And this is essential part of the, of the desk research. You need to have the references. So thank you for your attention. We will stop here. I will again ask whether you have any questions regarding the, today's topic. If not, we'll be seeing each other next Tuesday when we have guest lecture as well, and we'll be talking about quantitative research. Thank you for your time. Have fun while doing your desk research. <laughs>